Hello everybody, um, we want to get this final keynote session underway very timely. It's 2.27 and a bit. We're going to do it sharp at 2.30, so please find a place. And the winners of the uh, contest who are answering all the questions, your seating is arranged here, so the VIP uh, seating is here. I see the champagne is on ice and the caviar is on its way in. All right. All right, folks, we're going to get this show on the road. Uh, welcome back for our final plenary session. And it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce three cool dudes, uh, Sick Boy Podcast, uh, Brian Stever, Jeremy Saunders, and Taylor McGilvery. These three guys uh, are no strangers uh, when it comes to talking about illness. They started out in a public library recording room. Then they moved into their host's own uh, recording studio, and they got funded by a hugely successful Kickstarter campaign, and within weeks, it was among the top-rated podcasts in the country, and they're up to around 227 of these. Through the power of storytelling, laughter, and vulnerability, they aim to amplify the patient voice and destigmatize what it means to be sick. Taking the lead from Jeremy's lifelong battle with cystic fibrosis, these three best friends provide an inspiring new perspective on healthcare. Whether we're sick or healthy, we're all human and we're all dying. So let's talk about it. I, when I learned that they were coming, I actually listened to a couple of these things and it was, found it really engaging, interesting, thought provoking. Their presentation title is Laughter is the Best Medicine. So please welcome the threesome, Sick Boy Podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, all right. Mic's on. Mic's work. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, hello. Oh, I like this. This is kind of like my primary class. Uh, thank you guys so much for having us here. We are, um, I think I speak for the three of us when I say that we are really uh, thrilled and honored to speak in front of an audience whose work resonates so strongly uh, with our own and a lot of the things that we believe in. So thank you so much for having us. We are, uh, we're really stoked to be here. Uh, I want to kick off today, or we want to kick off uh, today, with um, a few questions. And I would love it if you would respond by a round of applause. So, to get started, by a round of applause, how many of you think that you could recall the most delicious meal that you've ever tasted? Okay, okay how about this one? By round of applause, how many of you think you could recall the most beautiful sunrise or sunset you've ever witnessed? Oh. 
Okay, how about this one? Uh, by a round of applause, how many of you think you could recall the most mind-melting orgasm you've ever had? <laughs> All right, thank you for your honesty. Uh, well, I'm willing to bet that the majority of you would actually have a much harder time recalling the most satisfying breath you've ever taken. Um, breath appreciation is something that is very near and dear to our hearts for many different reasons. Um, and we like to practice uh, breath appreciation every day um, with a little exercise. And uh, we would actually love it if you would all uh, join us in doing that exercise uh, right now. So I'll just describe it to you. We'll, we'll kind of get that rolling and then, we'll, then you can join in and we'll do it all together. So I want you to come up to the very edge of your seat. Sit up as tall as you can. Root your feet into the ground. Let your hands rest like wherever, there's, wherever they're comfortable on your thighs and your lap. Relax your shoulders and try to make your belly really soft. So what we're gonna do is we're, we're gonna draw out one single inhale, um, about four to five seconds on the inhale. And then at the top of that inhale, instead of naturally going right into the out breath, I'm gonna ask that you pause for a moment. And in that moment of pause, See if you can tune into the physical sensations of the breath that you just took in, right? So see if you can feel how the, the rib, rib cage has expanded outwards. See if you can feel the, the diaphragm, how it's dropped. See if you can literally tune into the oxygen-rich blood that is coursing through your veins. And then after that brief, uh, mindful moment of pause, together we'll all sigh it out on a nice audible exhale, okay? So close your eyes. And together, take a nice long breath in. Hold it for a moment. And then let it go. <sighs> That's a beautiful sound. Now, that is better to me than the most delicious meal that I've ever tasted. That's uh, more impressive than the most beautiful sunrise or sunset I've ever witnessed. Hell, to me, that felt better than the best <laughs> orgasm I've ever had. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No. That's no. a lie. <laughs> it might be a lie. It's all yeah, pretty good, though. That's a blatant lie. But, but it did feel good. And I think you get the idea, right? Breath appreciation is, is extremely important to us. And a, a very big part of that is, is because I live with cystic fibrosis. And a very real part in living with cystic fibrosis is knowing that I only have so many of those long, rich, deep breaths left. Before we go any further, we should probably um, introduce ourselves. Right. That's a good idea. I'm Brian. Uh, I'm one of the uh, co-hosts and producers of Sick Boy Podcast. I am Taylor, also co-host, co-producer, Sick Boy Podcast. And oddly enough, I'm Jeremy, also a <laughs> uh, producer and co-host of Sick Boy Podcast. Um, but I, I think the, the other thing that the three of us share in common is that by trade we are storytellers. Mm. And that's kind of what we're here to do today is to share with you a number of stories. And I, I want to kick it off with, with one story that might give a little bit of more context into why we are here. Uh, this story takes place back when I was 16 years old. It was in my hometown of Halifax, Nova Scotia. I had gone to see this play titled um, Zupa Circus Open Theater Kitchen. And I'd like to take a second and read to you the synopsis of this play right now. A wild theatrical feast, open theater kitchen is part comedy, part creation myth, part tragedy, part cooking show. <laughs> it is the story of two chefs who live alone in a kitchen in a desert. Desperate to combat their loneliness, they cook up the recipe of recipes, the flavor of all flavors which takes the form of a son. The delight of parenthood soon gives way to panic when the boy encounters the onion, a monstrous, prophetic, transformative force of nature lurking in the root cellar. It possesses him and forces a revolution of imagination, possibility, and rock and roll in the hitherto dreary landscape. What? <laughs> Sounds like a bit of a weird play, right? And it was this, uh, this, charming, weird show. Um, 
Actually, during the entire performance, the actors are on stage, they're cooking a bowl, they're cooking a, a, a pot of soup. And at the end of the show, the entire audience is invited down onto the stage to enjoy the soup with them while they have a Q&A. But that's not what made this night so remarkable for me at 16. What made this night so memorable was the performance of one man by the name of Ben Stone. Just by chance, is there anyone in this room who knows who Ben Stone is? Perfect. <laughs> by day, Ben Stone is a school teacher. And by night, Ben Stone plays a boy and an onion. And what made this so memorable for me at 16 was watching his ability to step out onto a stage and simply through the use of his physicality and through the use of his voice, he was able to capture an entire audience and place them into the palm of his hand. This is one of the most impressive things I've ever seen in my entire life up to this point. And that night was the night right there that I decided from this moment forward for the rest of my life, I want to be an actor. The worst financial decision I've ever made in my entire <laughs> life. Yeah. But that is what I went on to do. I, I started a career in acting. I don't regret it. I loved it. And acting was, for me, a, a, a great way to fulfill this, this creative need that I had, this drive. But it also, oddly enough, ended up becoming this incredible form of alternative therapy for me. You see, every time I took on a new role, I was given an opportunity to wholeheartedly live a life of somebody else, somebody who was not affected by cystic fibrosis. To me, acting was just as good as a cure. But it was also the creative form of expression that led me onto this path of stumbling into the, the wonderful world of podcasting. And for us, Sick Boy Podcast started uh, really organically. I had just moved home from living abroad for four years, and Tiller and Jeremy and I were getting together at our local library for these weekly creative sessions. And during one of those sessions, we were talking about some of our favorite podcasts, and we had this like light bulb moment where we were like, we should start our own show. And it turned out that uh, Jeremy was already sitting on this idea where he wanted to sit down with a doctor and have like a really clinical conversation about cystic fibrosis. And I know what you're probably thinking, that sounds super boring, right? That's what. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> That's Choose, what Taylor and I thought. Not anyway. the right crowd, right? Choose your audience, Brian. <laughs> Lord. So, Taylor and I didn't want our, oh, our friend to totally embarrass himself by putting out that content. So, we suggested taking a, a bit more of a comedic approach. Uh, the three of us sat down that very same day and we recorded what would become the first episode of Sick Boy Podcast. And uh, This might be the worst thing that I could possibly say in this moment. Please but say Would it. you say that CF is the equivalent of like YOLO? Oh my God. <laughs> no, no, no what, I mean, what I mean is bro, you bro, said bro, that you bro, didn't. Bro, 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 bro. It's so YOLO. You know, you only live once. I've got CF. Well, that, like, like, absolutely. As dumb as you phrase that question, <laughs> keep, you, are keep, abso you are absolutely right. When your friends don't, don't want to go out Jeremy. and like have a good time, you know, you're feeling like you want to go have a few drinks, definitely pull out the guys. I have CF and I'm gonna die soon. <laughs> and you're saying no. It does speak to how comfortable. Yeah. A couple of friends can yeah. be with each other yeah, exactly. to, to like throw that out there, and me to know that you're joking. <laughs> <laughs> but not really. Like, I am joking, but not fully. <laughs> <coughs> oh my god. I love that animation. That's from a, uh, that is from a, uh, a documentary that was released on CBC a couple of years ago um, about the podcast. Um, listening back to that first episode, we realized that we were on to something uh, kind of unique and kind of special, or at least, um, at least we thought that was the case. Um, it was the first time that we had had a conversation about what it was like to be sick that wasn't just wrapped in uh, sadness and that it wasn't just a total bummer. It was, uh, it was really educational. Jeremy and I, up until this point, have been friends for, I think, five years. I learned more in that hour, hour about Jeremy's CF than I had in that entire five-year span. Um, it was hilarious. We laughed uh, maybe way too much. <laughs> and uh, and we, were, we left feeling like really inspired and uplifted uh, to do it again. 
Um, but there was this thought of in the, back of in the back of our minds, maybe that was a fluke, or maybe because, of course, we think we're funny, and we think that we're interesting, we're best friends, why wouldn't we? But does anybody else think that this is funny? Does anybody else think that this is an interesting conversation to have or to listen to? So to put this to the test, we decided we would call uh, one of uh, the sickest people that we know, and at that time uh, was a friend of ours named Matthew Amiot. Uh, Matt Amiot had just been given the diagnosis that he had a brain tumor. And so we thought, we'll, we'll get, bring him into the recording studio and have a conversation about anything and everything to do with his diagnosis with having a brain tumor, what it was like to get the news, what it was like to get treatment and radiation on his brain, what it was like to have to tell his friends and his family that he has a, a tumor that's growing in his head. And we left this conversation with Matthew with no doubt in our minds that that first conversation was no fluke at all because we learned even more than we thought we ever could about what it was like, like what the experience of being sick was. We laughed our asses off again, possibly too much. And we left feeling more inspired to keep having these same conversations. And Matt's episode went on, in hindsight, to really be the foundation for what we wanted every future episode of Sick Boy to be. So uh, fast forward from that moment with Matt up until today, the ball just kind of kept rolling. And we have recorded and published uh, almost 230 episodes. Uh, we've traveled across Canada and down through the United States. And we've spoken to people living with everything from um, cystic fibrosis to terminal cancer, PTSD, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, PCH, PVH, PNH. Yeah, every, all the P's, all the H's. Uh, um, and if we haven't touched on it, we, we most certainly will, because we are currently sitting on a list of over 1,300 people from across the world who've actually applied to step up to the mic and share their story about what they've been going through. Um, I'd like to take a moment now to just kind of introduce to you uh, to some of the people that we've had on the show. This is Jessica Grossman. She has Crohn's and colitis. Uh, she also has an ostomy, and she's a professional model. And uh, she actually models in her ostomy bag. Um, Uncover ostomy, if you want to check her out on Instagram. She's, she's up to some really cool work. This is uh, Azura Goodman. Uh, she has anorexia. And she was actually the first guest that we recorded with outside of Halifax on our first uh, trip to Toronto. Uh, this, someone you might recognize, this is uh, Colonel Chris Hadfield. Um, he's, uh, he's not sick. Um, <clears throat> he is, like, sick. <clears throat> but he's, not, he's not ill. Yeah. Um, we talked to Chris about uh, all the effects that basically space, going to space, has on the human body, which was <clears throat> really fascinating. Mm -hmm. This is Sarah. She has a number of uh, inoperable <clears throat> facial tumors. And this is Josh Cassidy, uh, a Paralympic wheelchair athlete, and we really enjoy getting our pictures taken with him because we all look tall. <laughs> but he's way stronger than us. <laughs> yeah. uh, you could snap me like a twig. Uh, this is Caleb. Caleb um, has um, uh, ADHD. ADHD. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a little <laughs> moment there. Caleb has ADHD, and he is the world's biggest Britney Spears fan. This is true. This, uh, this photo actually means the world to us. This young gentleman, who I am playing uh, uh, mock guitar with half of his leg, is Brandon. And we met Brandon on the show. Um, and after our one hour recording with him, we very soon became best friends. And Brandon actually holds the record for having uh, been on the show more than anybody else because Brandon's cancer just kept, kept coming back. He had an osteosarcoma, lost his leg, and then, and then we continued having him on. And uh, sad to say that, that Brandon recently passed away due to his battle with cancer, but um, he will be greatly missed, and I'll never not forget this moment. Um, 
Here's the thing, when we started this, we, we did not think that it was going to become anything other than three friends dicking around on some recording equipment that we didn't even know how to use. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, actually five years later, we still have no clue how to use <laughs> half the equipment that we use. We should do something about that. Um, but it didn't take us long to quickly realize that this is something, these conversations that we're having is something much, much greater than, than ourselves. I'd like to now take a moment to introduce to you to somebody else that we had on the show, somebody who really um, made us aware of how vital and important some of these conversations are. Someone by the name of Andrew Henderson. Andrew was living with uh, T-cell lymphoblastic lymphoma, and he was given a very short amount of time to live out the rest of his life. He was, he was aware of this. But before I tell you how Andrew handled his, his battle with cancer, I want to first paint a picture for you of who Andrew was. So when we met Andrew, it was in this makeshift recording studio that we had set up in a, a hotel room in downtown Toronto. It was on the first trip that we had ever taken outside of our hometown uh, to record episodes of the podcast. So we get a knock on the door, and I go, I answer the door, and I'm greeted by this, this short, chubby, boyish looking man with bright eyes, fair skin, fair hair, this nice little mustache. And he was wearing these skin, skin tight black leather pants and this beautiful, voluptuous fur, black fur vest with nothing on underneath. Um, <laughs> He had these beautifully long, ruby red, perfectly manicured nails and an impressive amount of glittery eye shadow. And he was holding on to what I swear was the largest bottle of champagne I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, needless to say, Andrew was absolutely fabulous. And so we are there to talk to Andrew about his battle with cancer. We waste no time and get straight into the conversation. I was gonna say, what, what, uh, what brings you to our hotel room today? Well, these three boys messaged me on Grindr and invited me to the hotel room. <laughs> 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 I just figured, Wait. well, why not? I'm up for it. I'm not, I was oh, told I have terminal yeah. cancer. Why not? Oh, yeah. Live life, right? Uh, if that went over your head, <laughs> Grindr is, a, is an all-male gay dating app, so right away we knew that our senses of humor were going to mash up pretty well. Really, really well. And so for the next hour or so, we spoke and we laughed about every single detail of Andrew's journey with cancer. Um, he chronicled the, the challenges of, of going through chemotherapy. He talked to us about how tough it was to have individual phone calls with his closest family members and his friends to tell them that he's dying. He talked about how hard it was for him to have to uproot his entire life in Toronto and move back to his hometown in Winnipeg for treatment. And this all sounds really heavy, but it wasn't. That conversation was so light. It was so full of this playful joy. It was chock full of inappropriate humor. And eventually we get on to the, the topic of Andrew's ideal funeral. What, uh, if you were to have your funeral tomorrow, yeah, what would be like, the ideal um, situation? So I want to be embalmed in a champagne bottle. Oh my God, it's right here. <laughs> it's, it's, champagne's my life right force. Yeah. It is like... Yeah, so I was like literally talking to glass artists, being like, can you do a life size, like a human size champagne bottle? <laughs> Which wouldn't be that huge, because I think when you get, oh wait, oh my fuck, you said embalmed in a. Yeah, like I want to be corked. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yeah, I, 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 holy like, fuck! When I you first you meant... said embalmed, I thought. Uh, I pictured cremated. Yeah, me too. Oh no. Like, you're talking like, you're my talking like. Body. Full body. <laughs> <laughs> Just like nude floating in champagne for the oh, rest yeah. of Dude, existence. Hold on, hold on. Hold like a on. massive, like. Uh, Did anybody go, 
Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> uh, the people who did, I was like, you're the best people no. to have around. My family was like, that's not fuck that big. That and I was yeah. like, screw you guys. Like, this is my fucking dad. Yeah. That's, that's when you're yeah. like, fuck it, I'm moving to Toronto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the disagree. That's the yeah, yeah, disagree. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like, I'm not talking about expensive champagne. Here. Like, it can be Bambino. Just pour it in. <laughs> sealed up. Seal. You get it. <laughs> well, um, when Andrew died, that is exactly what he did. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Come on. Is that even legal? I, I don't know if that's legal. No, but what he did do, actually, <laughs> is I think far more impressive. Um, Andrew put on this performance art piece titled Taking It to the Grave. And I, I want to take a moment to read to you um, somebody's experience who was actually at this living funeral. Erica, the hostess, enters and stands on a chair in white jeans and a sheer beaded top. She explains how the night will unfold. She leads us into the space where Glam Drew, this is Andrew's alter ego, lounges shirtless, dressed in white, wearing a glittering gold cat eye mask and makeup. He's spread out on a beige chaise crowned by a tulle champagne bottle topper encircled by an altar of objects, candles, cloth roses, glittering tchotchkes, a Roman bust, a framed photo of Kim Kardashian. <laughs> to his right, a shroud of green fabric ghosts dangle above floor pillows, inviting guests to relax and take cover. Dance music throbs through the speakers. There is gold everywhere. People crowd in, finding seats on the floor, in the formal seating area in front of Glamdrew, hidden amongst the dangling green ghosts. The performance begins. Erica sweeps gold glitter inside a diamond demarcated by tape between Glamdrew and the audience. She invites us to join her. Behind her, Glamdrew waits for people to approach. They come forward one by one to say goodbye, chat, joke, and sob. Each audience member is invited to confide a regret or secret to Glamdrew. Then Glamdrew, the individual, and tattoo artist Carly Boyce will agree upon a symbol to represent the regret. Glamdrew then has these symbol, symbols tattooed on his body. Carly on one side with her stick and poke, the mourner on the other. Over the course of a few hours, I'm showered by glitter while friends dance together. I exchange words of comfort, make small talk at the manicure bar, dance and sing along to Madonna's Like a Prayer. Camera at the ready, I crouch inches away from family members saying goodbye. At one point, I take a break, crossing back into the other space for a drink of water. Alone and up against a wall, I do a handstand. I don't know why. As the performance draws to a close, Erica showers Glamdrew in champagne while he stands in a kiddie pool. Then she invites audience members forward to pour water over him. Three days after this performance, Andrew died. Andrew's death was the catalyst for a lot of introspection and reflection for us. He was the first sick boy guest to pass away. And when we look back at it, we realize that Andrew Henderson was the human embodiment of exactly what Sick Boy was striving to be. He was hilarious, he was inspiring, and he taught us how to face our own mortality in the most beautiful and gracious way. It was also the first time that we realized <laughs> how important it is for uh, a patient to have a voice and, uh, and a say in the care that they receive. <clears throat> Andrew wanted to be as you can all see, the curator of his own death. He wanted to be very involved in the process, and he took a really similar approach to his treatment all along the way, and his, really his overall experience in the healthcare system. Andrew taught us many things. 
And the most important one that we realized after we launched the episode and we started getting feedback from our listeners was this sort of aha moment, this very kind of profound realization, this kind of last gift that Andrew left with us. The importance of being a active participant in your own healthcare. So why does this work? Why has this podcast um, succeeded on, on such a global scale? I'm sure there's a ton of different reasons for that, but um, I can think of one big one that stands out for me personally. Um, I think one of the things that really worked for us was the fact that we have never once censored a single episode of Sick Boy Podcast, which is really funny because when we started this entire project, I remember having the conversation with the guys early being like, okay, this has to be super accessible. It's got to be a family show. There can't be, <laughs> there can't be any swearing. Okay, no like over the top taboo subject matter. But really quickly when we started having these conversations and diving headfirst into these really challenging um, subject matter, we started to realize that the thing that our guests are dying for is to just be real. And that means getting your hands into the nitty gritty. That means being unapologetic and unpolished. That means being truly authentic. And so from day one all the way up until now, we have not, nor will we ever, censor a single episode of Sick Boy Podcast. I think the, the second reason why this works is because um, we've never been afraid to ask tough questions. Actually, uh, in the beginning, we were afraid, but we, we asked them anyway. It felt like we had kind of created this space where nothing was off limits. It wasn't until we went from talking about physical illness the first time to the first episode we did on mental illness that we actually felt like this sense of uneasiness again. Um, you know, we knew very little about mental health at the time, and I think society at large is still working to better understand it. So when we were getting ready to sit down with this young woman uh, who had bipolar 2 disorder, I remember saying to the guys, do you think that there's anything that we could say to her that would like cause her to you know, break or lose her mind or have this manic episode? And in the end, we just approached the conversation the same way we did the ones on physical illness before that, from a place of compassion. And when you do that, there's no telling that you won't make mistakes or say the wrong things. But if you come from that place of compassion, those mistakes can be forgiven. And it'll only serve to strengthen your relationships by having that open and honest conversation. Mm -hmm. And finally, we utilize our affinity for humor. Um, as, as we've kind of put on display for you all so far, <laughs> is that's what our relationship is built on. It's built on humor. It's built on laughter. It's built on uh, poking fun at each other. And what we really want to do is just take that and extend that to, out to everybody who we have on the podcast. Now. Who would have thought that laughing about the experiences that go along with what it's like to be sick would have struck a chord? I don't think sitting in the library on that first day, I don't think we thought that, but uh, it did. And it is the fundamental element of Sick Boy, of what we do, that allows the project to grow bigger and better and wider um, each and every day. <clears throat> when we hear from guests, when we get feedback from guests, is what they take from the podcast, Something that we hear all the time is that they feel like they are right there with us, like they're in the room, like they're a part of the conversation. And that is exactly our intention. That's exactly what we want them to feel like. Come on in and listen to some of the hardest, some of the darkest, uh, some of the saddest things that people have ever had to go through in their entire lives, but with a very, very important twist. Laughter. Now it's the tool that we use to get to the heart of the real stuff. It's the thing that allows us to take something that for all time has been shrouded in sadness and heaviness and darkness and turn that conversation on its head into something that is really fun and really engaging and ultimately really inspiring. Uh, a short, quick example of that is um a story that we've told on the podcast that I've shared, which is, I, I would say, it's safe to say it, it's the, it was the scariest moment of my entire life. 
<laughs> which is not something that you would normally equate with um, something funny. Um, but bear with me. Uh, <laughs> October 2017, uh, due to complications of my cystic fibrosis, I had come down with what's called intussusception. Not to be confused with the popular Christopher Nolan movie, Inception. You know, where it's a dream Great within film. a dream within a dream. Um, but intussusception is not that different. It's basically an intestine within an intestine <laughs> within an intestine. I know, I know there's some like physicians in the room, but for those of you who aren't aware, basically and you that. may not have heard of this before, uh, what was happening was essentially my, my large intestine was literally swallowing up my small intestine, <laughs> like how you would roll up a pair of socks. And this is not good. Uh, <laughs> apparently you can die from this. And so I was rushed into the hospital. We went through uh, an emergency, what's called a hemicolectomy. So a, a, I might have not pronounced that right. But basically, they, they removed 75% of my large intestine. Got conf confirmation, it was a hemicolectomy. <laughs> so they took 75% of my large intestine, and they, they threw it in the garbage or wherever. <laughs> wherever wherever they, that goes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But before all that fun stuff, I had to go through a round of, of preliminary tests. So we were, we were basically trying to figure out what's going on with, with Jeremy's body. One of these pre preliminary tests was your, your standard rectal exam. Been there, done that, no problem. So I'm laying on the, on the bed uh, in the ER waiting for the doctor to come in. And he opens the door and in walks the doctor. And I look up and it's this six foot five, 240. 50 pound beast of a human with these massive mitts for hands and these like kielbasa sausage fingers and I'm like this guy? I gotta get a, a rectal exam from this guy? And he goes no 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 it's going to be the resident surgeon and ushers in this petite young woman with normal human size hands. Whew, okay well she gloves up Right, takes her finger, buries it knuckle deep into my butt. And I'm not a stranger to having a finger up my butt. <laughs> However, not so familiar with having a stranger's finger that far up my butt. That far. <laughs> well, here's the thing though. She's not so much a stranger. Like, I feel like I know this woman. <laughs> I just, I just can't quite put my finger on it. <laughs> Sorry. Right. It's all right, I couldn't not. Yeah. So anyway, whatever, she, they do the, the exam, she takes her finger out, goes into the hallway to deliberate about whatever it is you deliberate about after having your finger up someone's ass. <laughs> and, then, and then they come back in momentarily. <laughs> and I remember turning to my wife and I said, I'm gonna ask her how I know her. My wife's like, don't do that, please. <laughs> so I look up and I say, excuse me, ma'am, how do I know you? And I swear to God, this is the first time she made eye contact with me. She looks at me and she goes, yeah, you're my yoga instructor. <laughs> so I've been teaching yoga for like the last nine years and needless to say, she hasn't come back to the studio since. <laughs> Not yet. Give her time. Yeah. Time. Did I say scariest moment of my life? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm at most embarrassing moment of my yeah. life. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> let's bring this back in. <laughs> What's the takeaway here? Um, you know, out of, out of, <laughs> push that to the side. There is something. There's something um, there. The, we've been doing this show for almost five years now. And over these past five years, out of all of the conversations that we've been having, out of all the lessons that we've learned, um, I think it's safe to say that we've, we've boiled down three key takeaways for us, having gone through this experience. And this is actually what we want to leave with you today. We call these our three aha moments. Ah, nice little effect how it appears there. And the first one is that life is too short for small talk. This is something that we've kind of developed over the years of doing the podcast. And what this always brings me back to is this experience that I had about four years ago. I was in Utah, and I was snowboarding. And I was on the mountain by myself that day. And I got to the bottom of a run, 
and hopped onto the chairlift. And I was sharing the chairlift with three other people. There was uh, an older couple to my right, and there was an even older gentleman sitting to my left. And I was sort of keeping to myself, head down, until the guy to my left sticks out his hand and says, hey, my name's Bill, nice to meet you. So I lift my head and I shake his hand. I say, hey, Bill, nice to meet you, my name's Taylor. He follows up his introduction with this question. Oh, awesome, nice to meet you, Taylor. Um, what's the craziest thing that's ever happened to you in your entire life? <laughs> Excuse me? Sorry, Bill? <laughs> do, we, do we know each other? <laughs> I'm blown away that he's asked that this is the very first question that he asks me. So, and I've never even, I don't even know if I've ever, ever even thought of what the answer to that question might be. So I'm like, well, Bill, just give me a second here, let me think. I compose myself, I think about it for a second. And then, light bulb, this time that I had a bit of a, a near death uh, miss in Brazil when I was traveling a few years earlier. So I tell him this story. And then his question, of course, provoked me to ask him in return, well, what's the craziest thing that's ever happened to you in your life? And he tells me this crazy story of when he was traveling in, in the 70s. And, and he, he finishes telling me this story, and he follows it up with, OK, OK, um, if you can do one of two things for the rest of your life, one of these two things, you can only choose one rest of your life, what will it be? Snowboarding or sex? Bill, <laughs> first meeting. <laughs> I think about it for a second. <laughs> I give it some real thought, and I just think about it logically. For sex, I need somebody else. For snowboarding, I just need me, two feet. So snowboard. I pick snowboarding. And he's, he's OK, OK, OK. The couple to our right, <laughs> they are mortified of the conversation that we are having. Now. Uh, we're in Vancouver. I'm assuming a lot of you have uh, been on a chairlift once or twice in your lives. And when you get to the top, you can usually go left or you can go right. And, and when we got to the top, I went left and Bill went right. And I never saw Bill again. But I will never forget Bill. Because even though we only had a few minutes on a chairlift in Utah, he asked me a question that said something about me, about the real me, and in turn provoked me to ask it back and to get something from him. And Bill and I, because of that, went from being complete strangers to being great friends in the matter of seconds. And that interaction has always stuck out to me really vividly because Bill didn't ask me about the weather. And he didn't ask me about how I'm doing today, which we rarely answer honestly to begin with. We took advantage of every second that we had together before we were just spit back out onto the mountain, never to see each other ever again. The second aha moment is your actions can change the world. Now this sounds really grandiose, I know. Just bear with me for a moment though. Why did I tell you the story of Ben Stone, teacher by day, actor by night? Well, I told you that story to give you a little bit of context into why we are standing here, also to pad up the 45 minutes that we have on stage. <laughs> um, but let's unpack that for a second, right? So 16-year-old me goes and sees this show in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and this one man's performance inspires me to become an actor. And I do that. I go on that path of acting, and acting leads me into the world of podcasting. And we start Sick Boy. And, and Sick Boy ends up getting pumped out across the world and is being listened to by tens of thousands of people across the world. And out of those tens of thousands of people that listen, we receive countless emails, direct messages, letters from people who are reaching out to tell us how much this show has had a profound effect on their life how the conversations that we are having on the podcast are fundamentally changing the way that they relate to their own illness, how it's changing the way that they communicate with their friends or their family. And all of that change, that beautiful change, I don't think would be possible if it wasn't for that one performance 
by that one man on that one night when I was 16. And as far as I'm concerned, or we're concerned, that could have been the shittiest performance of his entire run. But for me at 16, that was one of the most profound moments of my entire life. Do not ever underestimate that the words that you choose, the actions that you use on a daily basis, can and will go on to have a profound effect on the people's lives that you surround yourself with, whether you come to realize this or not. And the third and final aha moment is every single person has an incredible story to tell. Every caregiver, every patient, every doctor, all of you, everybody has an incredible story to tell. When we look back at the over 200 conversations that we've recorded on the podcast, um, we realize that the majority of our guests are not celebrities or storytellers by trade. They're just regular, everyday people. But if you take the time to sit down with somebody and ask them engaging questions and really take the time to listen to them, you'll find that every single person does have an incredible story to tell. And what I want to be careful not to do is I, I, I want to let you know that I can't overstate how important it is that patients have a voice, voice in their health care. Um, my mom had bladder cancer. And I was standing in my kitchen chatting with her a couple weeks ago. And I looked at her and I said, um, Mom, what was the best experience you had in the hospital? And instead of picking out a, a moment, she actually started listing um, qualities of her doctor to me. She was like, he was kind. He was thoughtful. He was compassionate. But the most important thing that she said that was that in, in spite of how chaotic the hospital can be, he actually took the chance, the opportunity to make her feel like she was the only person in the entire world. Now, there is a, a very fine and a very delicate balance between the data and the diagnoses that get jotted down on paper and the real life human experience of what it's like to be sick, to truly live with an illness. In order for patients, for people, to have a voice, they need to feel like they have a voice. And that's where we come in. And going back to why it's so lovely to be here talking to a group like you is because that's where you come in. We aim to give that voice. Sick Boy aims to give that voice. So before we, uh, before we wrap this up and send you off into the world to cut out the small talk, to choose actions and words that might have a profound effect, or to root out those stories that exist, Let's just take one more time to sit up and be grateful for that automatic physiological response that we so easily take for granted. So come up to the edge of your seat. Plant your feet. Soften your belly. And close your eyes. And together, take a nice long breath in. Hold it for a moment, and then let it go. <sighs> Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well. Thank you, gentlemen. That was uh, magnificent, and uh, you know the the message that uh, the, 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 of the many messages. Um, speak your truth. Speak it with compassion. Don't be afraid, and that actually is uh, Im immensely consistent with the messages that we've heard at this uh, conference this year and others. And it's uh, it's very cool. By the way, I know the answer to the question, Jeremy, where they put your intestine. They, they, they throw it in the composter so that the tomatoes are truly organic. <laughs> and look, 
Look, we may be older than you, but we're not so uncool. Even I know what Grinder is. <laughs> and I won't, I won't tell you why, but, and, it's, and, and it's true that I spend most of my time on those sites that give you tips on maintaining your personal hygiene into old age, but still, I'm part of the movement. So, we are, alas, uh, so quickly again at an end, um, and uh, I'm going to turn you over to my friend Andrew in a moment, but uh, as, uh, as has been said again to um, <clears throat> probably too much, this, this is my ninth time doing this, and uh, it's, not a, it's not an applause-seeking line. Yeah, good, you applaud if you want me to quit. Thank you, I'm done. <laughs> Um, but it's always, uh, it's always new, it's always fresh, and it's always a huge pleasure. And as long as I am uh, reasonably sentient, I realize my judgment on that will not be the one that counts. Um, you know, I just, I just love being here. And, and of all the, the meetings that I have gone to, the, just the buzz and the commitment, it, it does give us, it gives me reason for hope. And I just want to give a few thanks before uh, I turn you over to Andrew. Uh, first, um, uh, I want to thank, actually, in particular this year, the AV guys, because you, they had a bit big challenges. We had, uh, you know, not their doing some anxious moments, but it turned out that the, uh, the uh, remote uh, uh, technology worked exceedingly well, and as usual, thank you guys, you're so professional and helpful. And it's a, a big job to do it so well. Um, uh, I want to thank all of the speakers uh, and all of the concurrent presenters. Obviously, I could only get to a few, but as usual, the quality is high, the relevance is high, and the interactions in the different formats. So it's everybody's creative and everybody's engaged, and uh, it's remarkable uh, that the, the overflow in the rooms, I mean, it's that the biggest problem this conference has is accommodating everyone who wants to go to these things. So again, thank all of you. I certainly want to thank um, the council. And, and again, um, over these years, they're not only uh, the people who bring me here, uh, but uh, we're friends. And uh, it's great to have these friendships. It's great to see these people with such uh, renewable and renewed enthusiasm. They change it up. They find incredible different talent uh, to present. And it's just a joy to uh, interact with them once a year. And uh, finally, um, I, I want to uh, I want to thank you guys because every year I get to meet uh, new people, I get to see some uh, long-standing friends. I particularly want to thank um, Lawrence uh, Nixon's mother, who every year comes up and says to me, "Go Huskies!" You have asked Huskies football is a joint passion, and her son was a very good quarterback, and she comes here every year to keep make sure that my loyalties are intact. And though I love it here in BC, I'm sorry, we and our hockey team's going to kill yours on the weekend, so. Apologies for all that at the university level. And, uh, and for all of your enthusiasm, the storyboard presenters, the posters, it's just a magnificent event. So thank you once again for the opportunity to share this time with you. And now please welcome Andrew for some closing remarks. First of all, um, Brian, Jeremy, and Taylor, that was a fantastic way to bring our forum to a close. Thank you. That uh, was just what we needed, I think. I want to thank you, Stephen, for uh, you're one of the few people who've attended all of our quality forums, and your wit is fully intact. And, uh, and you heard it here first, we're going to get him to come back for a tenth year if, uh, if we can. Um, I just want to uh, give you a, a small token of our immense appreciation for everything you've done. I would also like to thank all the staff here at the Hyatt. They've done a fantastic job, including all the service staff, the AV folks. You guys uh, have had a challenging uh, forum. They've done a fantastic job. And all the others who make this event possible. Your level of customer service is exemplary. And um, you kept us all well fed and well supported. So thank you. This year, we've also heard from over uh, 200 speakers and storyboard presenters. They came from around our province and across our country and further beyond. Um, I, I thank all of them for sharing their insight and experience over the past two days, as well as the steering committee that actually helps plan and create such a compelling program every year. Um, we're all shaping success together. 
Um, but most of all, I, I also want to thank the, well, the Quality Forum is actually an intense effort, but I know it's three days, and you're all here um, for, for a brief time, but there's actually a team behind this that works all year long to make sure that this event comes off as well as it does. To my teammates at the council, you do this better than anyone else, and with smiles and attitude and laughter that make this conference a highlight of my year. And a special shout out to the internal team that makes everything happen here, uh, Bria, Melissa, Shauna, and Courtney. Um, you guys are rock stars, and to all the Red Vests, a huge thank you for everything you do. <laughs> Finally, to all of you, the, our quality community, thank you for all the work you're doing to improve care for British Columbians. It is tremendously important, it is hard, and I commend you for all that you've achieved. There was some fantastic work that has been displayed here over the last few days. I hope you're leaving with some new ideas, some new connections, and a renewed sense of passion and, and energy. And uh, I wish you safe travels home. I'd now like to welcome Sequalia back uh, to the stage to um, close our event in a good way. There, it's working. I just wanted to say I thank the young men who were up here before. I um, You do awesome work, and I've never cried before when I do a closing. And you touched my heart because so many people I know and lost didn't have a voice. And you made me think of all of them. And it really was emotional for me and I think, what if they could have been on your podcast? <laughs> because it would have helped their families. And that's what was impactful. I lost my 18-year-old um, nephew to lymphoma cancer last September. He was diagnosed just after April 13th, after his 18th birthday. He's the same age as my granddaughter, and by the end of September, he was gone. It was so devastating on us, and yet all throughout it, he was working to hold up his family and tell them what they needed to do after he left. And he was a brave warrior. And you know, all that we go through Everyone doesn't think about all of that and think about, and I always say, we all go through four doors in life. We have um, a fear, it can be anything. So then you go through the second door and you gain knowledge about that fear. And I always say I love reading, I'm a bookworm, and you know it from when I said I went into indigo and I read chakra book without buying it <laughs> in about half an hour because I speed read and I read Dune and I always loved that saying fear is a little mind killer they have the quote right at the beginning of Dune and that's what's shared throughout it right and my hu late husband learned from Mary Hilaire from Lummi Nation in the States. Fear, you learn about it. It can be anything. Fear about walking into a new job. Fear about walking in your doctor's office. Fear about meeting someone for the first time and not knowing what they think of you. 
anything fear about your illness. That's why yesterday when the for and against thing, and it's like, no, don't give them their EMR results because then they'll have a fear and think, oh my God, I'm dying, right? Because they don't know unless you have that relationship to explain it. And so you learn about your fear, then you walk through the third door and that we'll call wisdom, but it's also power. And power can be positive or negative. That's the thing about, you know, do you give it that info? And then the fourth door none of us can avoid is death and leaving this earth and knowing that you've lived a good life and that hopefully you've left a legacy where everyone loves you, everyone cared about you, and that you touched them in some way, like that song that says you were loved because you loved other people and helped them in some way. So my hands are up to you, my hands are up to the quality Council for inviting me and making me part of the family. My hands are up to each and every one of you for coming and being here. For each and every one of you, my hands are up that came up to me and talked to me and made me miss the second session yesterday. Because <laughs> you lifted my heart and spirit and then I realized it oh no, it's quarter to 12, I haven't made it to the room I was going to. <laughs> but you took that time and cared because of whatever I shared that resonated and touched your heart and spirit and your energy. And I loved it because that makes me feel like I'm leaving a legacy and I helped you in some way because we all need that at times. So my hands are up to you and my hands are up to the sound guys. My um, family from FNHA said, oh my goodness, it's like you're at the Oscars and you're, <laughs> because you're miking her up so well every day. And I miss coming to see you this time, so now I'm having you this. <laughs> so my hands are up to you and to the Hyatt staff for all they did. And I thank um, Andrew for his closing remarks because just like our elders and speakers and how we were taught, we were always told, and I tell new speakers in our longhouse, remember to thank the cooks, remember to thank the floor people, thank the firemen, thank this person, thank that person, and they're going, okay, Sequalia, yep, I've got it. Because my job is to be the matriarch that's making sure they are the mouth that's saying the right words. So my hands are up to you on a job well done the last few days. And to all the team, and I know, you know, like the awards that were given, my hands are up to the team that went through all those, like, 200 to cho choose those of you who received awards last night. You all did awesome work. I was initially involved and got to read some of them and talk about impressed and know that even though I didn't remember the names and areas of where you were from, throughout the year since June, I was sharing, hey, I heard about this project up north. You won the award on the, um, you know, doing the research with UBC. I heard, read about this and I start talking about it. And then I read the other ones and shared. So keep up all the good work that you do. And now I'm going to do, um, you know, and thank you for allowing me to just um, share some feeling with you. So, and knowing that um, maybe some of you I've met before and the other times I've been here and we're going to meet again because as they always say and I always believe 
Maybe you look at someone and you look and go, whoa, that person's going to be significant, something about them, or whoa, you smile and don't talk and then a month or two later you bump into them and then you ended up being connected on a project. Fate makes you come into each other's lives and the networking here is what makes everyone be able to ch exchange cards and ideas and make things better. Not for yourselves, not for your current patients, but for the ones that are going to come afterwards into the future. So always think about that. You're, there's the past, there's now, and you're working towards a better future for our, maybe my great-grandchildren. So I want to um, say that I've really enjoyed being here and glad that I was able to be here for the three days and share time with all of you. Because I, even though I was, stayed in a room and didn't like the pillows and didn't like that heater and kept me up till 3.30 um, on Tuesday or Wednesday morning, so yesterday was a long day. I um, was glad that I was here and able to because yesterday I got energized by all of you and went, walked away and I, like, I was like, I'm going to go up to my room and go to bed now. Took me an hour and a half to get up to my room because <laughs> I was having so much fun talking to people and I was like, then went, I don't feel tired anymore. So keep being in that good state of mind. Now I'm going to ask you to stand. And today we're going to do something a bit different because I have a bit of time. And I hope no one has to rush off for a plane. And so up to the lady here, put your hand up in the gray sweater. Yep. Okay, all of you are going to be eagles. So when I sing a song, you're going to have to be evil. Move around a bit. I know eagles like to sit in a tree and watch for a cat or dog or <laughs> something to eat, but I want you to not be sitting in the tree. Then the next, um, probably tell here, you're all the wolves which is good because there's counsel here. Because <laughs> the uh, FNHA adopted you. So then wolves, you have to go like this. Here's the snout. Here's your tail. Come on. <laughs> if I don't see you doing it, you're going to end up having come up and be uh, do it yourself. The next um, three tables after that to um, the lady in the black blazer with, um, yeah, see, I'm pointing, yeah, put your hand up. These few tables, so we have the eagles, we have the wolves, then we have the yo-yos, the killer whales. So you're going to... And you last rose, you're the salmon that all the other three hunt <laughs> and eat. So salmon have to go up the river and they like to jump out of the water. So you can all be creative. Yeah, I see some of you. Come on, salmon. Those yo-yos and wolves and eagles are going to get you if you're not energetic. This was actually a, a song that started with the Northern Nation, and they sang their song with it. My nieces and nephews adapted it and changed the ravens to salmon, 
and we do it to my great, my grand uncle, Kwatayath, and that's my younger brother's ancestral name. That's um, Chenault's sister's son. And so this is his song. And I'm going to sing it, and then I'm going to be going like, Yo ho ho he ho he ho he ho he eagles come out and play yo and that's when you're going to dance. Then I'll we'll finish and you can stop flying around. <laughs> Go sit in the tree. Then I'm going to sing and then say Takaya, come out and play. Oh, and I forgot something. What do wolves do? So let's hear the wolves. Woo! Hey, you have to howl. Are we wolves? Yeah. You're, wo you're wolves. And then I'm going to call the yo yos. Then you're going to have to. Right? Then the salmon. Then I'll sing the last verse and say, everybody come out and play. And that'll be the end of the song, and I'll just say a quick prayer after that to send us all, or maybe I'll do the prayer now. So open your hands, because then you can all fly out here, swim out here, or whatever. <laughs> And I say, put your hands by your side so you young men haven't been here. It's because it, my grandfather taught me that the Creator sends energy through the top of your head, and it comes in, and we all have an energy within us. You believe in your energy, and you can heal yourself or make yourself feel better if you believe in it. And um, that's why I read the Indigo book, because of someone said, you should get a chakra for this um, illness you have. And I went, oh, okay. And then um, read that they believe that the chakra, the energy, comes from the creator through the crown of the head, the third eye, through all the chakra points. And has the, you have that energy. And that's the same as our belief. And Grandpa said you keep your hands open. And like you... I always tell everyone, what do we do? Tai Chi breathing. And go, or yoga. <laughs> I usually say, now we're going to do Tai Chi and yoga, so let's do it. <sighs> Last one. Hands by your side. Chen Kwen Men Tomi Kaka Kanak Chase Yam Yon Sio and So Tenoy Up and Man Man to Squalls to Seeds Yon Sio Man Man Squalwen Sequedo Chet Squalwen to Squalls to Seeds. Asking you, Creator, and also all our ancestors in the family that have gone before us, to watch over and guide all of your children as they waste gain am tok. Let's go home. That while they travel and help them with their squalling. Am squalling, strong feelings in my heart for all of them because they've become friends. That they, they're squalling, their minds, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual well being is taken care of. And that their families squalling and mental, emotional, physical, spiritual well being is taken care of. Prayers for all our family, from the unborn to the oldest, for all their illnesses, and for all those battling alcohol and drugs and those incarcerated and those who have lost loved ones, who have AM squall and strong feelings in their heart to know their loved ones worry about them and walk with them. And the ancestors and family who have gone before us are always watching over and send those signs Hummingbirds, dragonflies, a wolf, whatever you see, 
maybe they've lifted your spirit for the day once you've seen them if you were feeling low asking you creator and ancestors and those who have gone before us see everyone home safely to their families and get make them arrive and with that good feeling and the tiredness of the last three days be a feeling of comfort and joy of new things learned and let their trips be successful and safe. Now we're going to dance. Y'all ready? Okay. <laughs> was excellent now I'll st what I said before is waste means let's go and I say that's like Nike they say let's do it I say waste let's go <laughs> and waste nam talk says let's go home tomorrow quetzi snatchum which I up yo you all take care <laughs>